Sherry Worrell. My middle name is Kelly. My maiden name, actually, but I go by Kelly. And I was born in New England. And um, I keep talking about myself. They like to tell you where you're and how it goes and stuff like that. But I was born in New England, and I was raised in a family that we always were very close. And growing up, we never knew much about James, or John Howard Gregory, and everybody called him JJH. My grandpa always said that he always carried gum in his pocket. He always carried hard candy in his pocket because he loved children, and no matter when he saw a child, he would reach into his pocket, pull out the gum, pull out the candy, and give it to the child. My mother and I started in doing genealogy in 1986. Our first lineage group was DAR. I'm a member now of Signal Hill Chapter, who meets in this library. And our next genealogy workshop is going to be the 18th in this room, in this library. And Kathy will be there, and I'll be there. So if anybody does have any genealogy questions and wants to know how to start it or do it, you're always welcome to join and be part of it. We're, it's always open to men and women, even though you're not DARs, but we do have a sister organization or a brother organization called SAR. James John Howard Gregory was born on the 7th of November in 1827 in Marblehead, Massachusetts. I'm going to kind of stand over here because I'm short and I can't always see over to see you. <laughs> he was the son of James and Ruth Roundy Gregory, and his father was a justice of the peace, a lawyer, and a customs officer. I have original records that he signed authorizing people as Revolutionary War things that I'm going to bring to the genealogy team to show because I think it's interesting. He was prepared at Marblehead Academy under John Maynard. He attended Middlebury College in Vermont. And he met two, two, he had many, many friends there, but two especially important people that I consider. The first was Martin Freeman, who was a class ahead of him. And Martin Freeman was an African-American man. He was the first president of an American college in New England. And then he left New England to go to Liberia College as the president of Liberia College. When he was over in Liberia, JJH sent him newspapers all the time so that Martin could keep in contact with people back here and know about the, what was happening in the States. Because he was African American, a lot of people didn't pay much attention to him. And one time while he was in school, JJH saw that during a commencement program, nobody was walking with him. So JJH left the person he was with, bolted across the room, put his arm through his, and walked with him so he would have a partner. It was that that turned them into lifelong friends. The second person that he met there was a fellow named Marcus Carlton. He and Marcus Carlton went to school at the same time, and then they left Middlebury to go to Amherst College, where they both graduated in 1850. Reverend Marcus Carlton became a missionary. He left after he got married, went over to India, and stayed here for the rest of his life. During the Indian famine, and the people were starving over there, JJH sent him vegetable seeds of all kinds so that he could teach the people how to cultivate, how to grow vegetables. He would then give them the seed so that they could plant vegetables and feed their communities. And that kept the people from starving. Marcus received a, an award from the government, and they asked him to be head of their interior department, but he said no, his service was to the Lord, not to, to the government. And he didn't accept their offer and stayed there until he died. After, after Marcus died, JJH set up a fund for him in Maine. He wrote a poem, one of his poems, the poem is over in one of those brochures over there, and he set up a fund. It was a fund that had money in it, and people who grew apples could every year compete for an award to get an award for, for growing the best apples. He didn't like Ben Davis apples, so Ben Davis apples were not included. If you grew Ben Davis apples, you couldn't get the award. Any other kind of apple, he would allow that. That was JJH, unusual. <laughs> As he did for India, he also did for the state of Nebraska. During the famine in Nebraska, he sent enough seed 
so that a thousand people could plant one fifth acre each to grow vegetables so that they could feed the communities of Nebraska. And again, he helped them save the people from dying. He did that many times all over the country, but those are two examples. He transferred to, as I said, to Amherst College where he graduated in 1850. He started out as an educator. He first taught at the farm school in Marblehead, then he taught at the Marblehead Academy, and then he became the principal of Derby Academy in Hingham, Massachusetts. In his last year, the boys and girls were finally taught together in one classroom. Up until he was there, they were always taught separately on different floors, but he didn't think that was really the right thing to do, so he, he integrated them, and it was during his last year that that integration finally happened. It was during his time at Derby Academy that he saw in the Farmer's Almanac a letter saying, does anybody know of a good winter squash? Well, when he was four, he loved gardening. So he was given his own garden at four years of age, and his biggest job was to pull out weeds. There was a lady in town named Marm Hubbard. Her first name was Elizabeth, but everybody called her Marm Hubbard. And when she had been to South America, she found the seed that she loved, and she brought it back, and she gave it to a gentleman named Captain Martin, who planted it in his garden. But he only planted it for his own family. So she didn't like that, so she went to JJH, and she said, I have the seed that I love. The squash is fabulous. And she said, maybe Captain Martin, if you're willing to plant it, maybe Captain Martin will give you a seed and try it. So he said, of course I will. And he did, and he grew it, and he started giving it out to his neighbors, and if he went on trips, he'd give it out to people that he ran into and things like that. But the most important thing is, he sent this seed to the gentleman who wrote and asked if anybody knew of a good winter squash. And when he did, he said, Here's the squash, we think it's great, please let us know what you think. Well, the guy planted it, and about a year later, he wrote a letter saying how fabulous the squash was. Well, JJ started getting all these seed orders from all over the world, and in order for him to keep uh, sending out these orders, he finally had to quit teaching and went into the seed business. And that's how he went into the seed business. Throughout his, throughout his whole life, he ended up introducing to the United States over 100 different types of vegetables, everything from asparagus to yams. And his greatest find was the Blue Hubbard squash. It was the combination of, hi Susan, it was a combination of the first squash that he did, which was that Hubbard squash, and then he also invented a marble blue squash, and the two of them were cross-pollinated to make the Blue Hubbard squash. Blue Hubbard squash became very popular, and one time somebody said to him, Mr. Gregory, what's the best way to open a Blue Harvard squash? I don't know if you know what Blue Harvard squash is, but it's about this big around. It's harder than a brick bat. <laughs> and, it's, and in order to open it, you have to open it with a hatchet. That's how we always open it, was with a hatchet, because it's so hard. And then you open it, and then you cook it, put it on a cookie sheet and turn it upside down and cook it upside down in the oven, like how you do most with your squashes anyway, to have it done properly. But they said, how the heck do you open this, Mr. Gregory? He says, me? I put it in a brown paper bag and drop it on the floor. That's the best <laughs> way to open it. He had a very, very good sense of humor. Throughout his life, people would suggest that he was not the originator of the squash or a certain brand of corn called the Cory corn. And he addressed this in a 1907 seed catalog by saying, as years have passed, occasionally, but most naturally, some of them have got confused in their memories and claimed one to have been the originate, original introducer of the Hubbard squash and another of the Cory corn. But our but on forwarding proof to the contrary, all have frankly acknowledged their mistake. He trusted everyone. His employees paid themselves. He never paid an employee in his whole life. He would, they would just fill out their cards, they would take it, a card in the cash register, pull out the money that they thought were owed. There was a treasurer that, that would sit there and hand the money, basically. And at the end of the week or the end of the month, whenever she thought she had a little bit too much money, she'd hand it to him, he'd fold it in half and stick it in his pocket. He never questioned anybody. My great-grandfather, who took over the business from him, did the exact same thing. He trusted everybody until he was embezzled. And he was embezzled by his secretary. And when the secretary was caught, they wanted him to 
press charges against her, and he said, no, it's not my job to judge somebody. That's God's job, so I can't judge her. And, but he said, but I will not keep her on as an employee because I can't trust you anymore. So he didn't employ her. Nobody would give her a job, and he felt badly about that. So he provided a home for her to live in so that she would not be out on the street, but he would not give her a job. And the day he died, Mary Nichols had a stroke. And the day he was buried, Mary Nichols died. He chose mostly women to work for him in, in his seed house, as he found them to be tactful, neat, careful, and precise. He wanted intellectual people, so of course he chose women, <laughs> and provided a family feeling so he could converse with his patrons, so most of his employees were high school graduates. And he mentioned this fact in his catalogs. After his retirement, Edgar ran the business, who was my great-grandfather. And as I said, he introduced, one of the things that he introduced was a Danvers carrot and a, a Danvers onion, and he named him over the town, uh, the town next to where he lived was called Danvers. He had 600 acres in a town called Middleton, Massachusetts. Uh, Middleton is near Marblehead. My great, my great grandfather was born there. Um, if you ever come up and look at this, the man in the back row with the beard is JJH. These were his employees. And all these people that worked on a farm in Middleton, he provided homes for. Uh, they lived across the street from the farm. He didn't charge them rent. He gave them all houses. And there's still one house left at 23 Gregory Street. Um, the street was named after him. So uh, they wouldn't have to worry about how they were going to pay for living expenses. He provided the home. He had three seed farms and 60 acres of land in Middleton, Marblehead, and then he bought in 1874, 600 acres more in Middleton and in Danvers, Mass. He is credited with having introduced seed packages, not the seed package themselves because that was beforehand, but he is credited with having to put the planting directions on the back of it, the type of seed and the directions, ounces and things like that, to make it more comfortable and easy for people to plant. In his 1870 catalog, he says, all the packages, ounces, etc., of the vegetable seeds sent out by my establishment that have printed labels on them giving the names of each variety with directions for cultivation. So it was even that far back that they started it. I don't know if I'm sure you've all heard of Luther Burbank. Well, Luther Burbank, he gave Luther Burbank his start in the business. Luther Burbank was, had grown a potato and he was showing it at fair in Lunenburg, Massachusetts, and he thought it was so fabulous that he wanted to sell it, sell the rights to it, so he could move to California, where he thought the grass was much greener. He wrote a letter to J.J.H. offering it to him, and J.J.H. said, I have so many potatoes, I'm willing to plant in the ground, see how it goes, and then we'll take a chance later on if it does well. Well, Luther Burbank didn't like that, so he wrote to him a bunch of other seed establishments, and none of them gave him even that kind of an opportunity. So back he goes to JJH. And JJH took the seed and planted it and did well. And um, Burbank then offered the rights to him for $500. And JJH Connor offered with 150 Well, Luther Burbank didn't like that very well either. And JJH finally said, basically, take it or leave it. Well, Burbank took it, moved to California, and years later, a few years later, he thought Gregory was making all this money off his potatoes. So he kept writing to him, asking for more money. And, and JGH said, I'm not making a lot of money off your potatoes. There's a ton of potatoes around here. He says, in fact, I'm giving you credit. I named the potato after you. I gave you 10 tubers so you could start your potatoes out there, which is doing much better out there than it is here. And he said, I don't owe you any money. In 1880, Burbank again wrote to JJH asking for an additional payment again. And he received the final, this letter from JJH. My dear sir, I have given you great fame by attaching your name to the potato and spreading it through the length and breadth of the land. I purchased the early Ohio at just about the same price. I gave you for your seedling 
did not give the originator's name to it, and have made greater sale of this item than the Burbank. As to the profit of selling potatoes in my business, with the cost of advertising and handling and loss by freezing, and the filling out of orders comes with the opening of spring, just when we are heels over head with work and filling seed orders, causing us such a week behind hand, I have half resolved more than once to the whole potato business as a pro unprofitable and a great nuisance. You mistake in inferring that all this notoriety upon Burbank means money for me. It rather means fame for you. The more generally it is advertised, the more completely it is taken out of my hands. I have stated the facts in the case and now enclose $25. For whatever I may write, I know you will feel that some recompense is owed to you. Burbank accepted the $25, and whatever resentment he had towards JJH eventually disappeared. He also came to realize the fame that JJH had brought him through the potato, and that is what started him on his great road to success. He had a town named after him, the Burbank potato is still popular, and whatever. In 1909 is when he developed Blue Hubbard squash, and as I said, there's seeds over there, there's packets that maybe would like to take one with them. These are not JJH's seeds, but they are Blue Hubbard squash seeds. He considered it very, it is his greatest find that he ever found. In your handouts, you will see a recipe for squash pie, and that is JJH's squash pie recipe. I found it in my recipe box that was in my grandfather's hand, saying Grandpa Gregory's Blue Hubbard squash recipe. So I thought people would like to have that. J.J.H. was married three times. His first wife was Elizabeth Candler Boudier. Um, they could not have children, so he decided that he was going to go and adopt a child. And the first one he went to adopt off was a little boy named, who was unnamed, but his last name was Bryant. They named him James Howard Gregory. He was known as Jamie. When he did not like school very much, he went to Mass Aggie, which is U of Mass now, and in 1850, he left. No, not 1890, he left. And his father sent him to Columbia, the country of Columbia, to work the family mines that he owned. Marcus Carlton, if you remember back then, married J.J.H.'s younger sister, and were living out there work at, um, handling the mines. They didn't work in the mines, but they were the people that ran the mines, and Jamie was sent there so that he could help them out and see if he could start a new life. Well, he did that for a while, didn't like that either. So he joined the Colombian Army, and he loved it and raised to the rank of Brigadier General down in Colombia. He married um, Victoria Calderon, who was a very important lady down there. They had ten children, one of whom was kidnapped. She was held for ransom. They paid the money. She got it, they got her back, and when they finally got her back, they sent she and Marcus and his wife back to the States so that they wouldn't have to worry about her being kidnapped again. After a while, they decided it would be nice to go and adopt a little girl. So they went to Boston to an orphanage to adopt a little girl, and they found a little girl named Annie. Her name was um, Sarah Anna Sophia Bennell but they changed her name to Annie Bouvier Gregory. Annie ended up getting married um, and moving to Connecticut, and a lot of people are still living in Connecticut. But while he was looking for this little girl, my great-grandfather was also in the orphanage. And what happened with my great-grandfather, he was born William Edgar Gamble. His father was a teamster and died in an accident when Edgar was a very young boy. His mother then developed pernicious anemia and was going to die. Lucy was a nurse, and Lucy decided that what she would do is she would put Edgar in an orphanage and she would work in the orphanage as a nurse so that she could be with him until he got adopted out. He was on crutches, he was cross-eyed, and he had to use crutches. And um, as J.J. was looking at Annie, Edgar was against the wall crying. And he says, why doesn't anybody ever want me? And J.J.H. walked up to him and he says, what's your name, boy? He says, well, people call me Billy, sir. He says, well, Billy, today's your lucky day, so I'm taking you home with me, too. And he did. He took him home, he got him surgery, and he allowed him to see his mother as often as he wanted to until his mother died. At that, 
approach, three months after he adopted Annie and Edgar, his wife died. So he, and then he remarried, and he married a lady whose name was Harriet Knight. Her, her married name was Knight. She was a widow, and she had had a son named Thomas. And so they raised the kids together. And then she died, and he married a third time, a lady named Sarah Lydia Caswell, who went by the name of Lily. And he was married to her until he died. During, during that time, there was a family in Lynn whose mother had died, and the father had arthritis so badly that he could not take care of the children. And he heard about it, so he adopted the little girl, and she became Laura. And Laura's family, she worked in the seat house. She lived with him until she married, and she married a coffin. And those people are still living in Marblehead. In fact, I'm friends with one of the people who is 89 years of age. And when I was out there doing this program a couple of weeks ago, she gave me a seed tester. And it's a ceramic, it's a pottery, it's not ceramic. But it looks like a muffin tin. And what they did is, is he got batches of seeds. He wouldn't just sell it. He wanted to make sure it was good. So he would put drops of water in all these little containers with the seed to see how quickly it germinated and if he liked the way it, the way it grew. And if he liked the way it did, then he sold the rest of the seed. But if he didn't, he just threw the whole thing away because his reputation was more important to him than his money. J.J.H. retired on the 1st of July in 1907 at almost 80 years of age. He wrote poems, articles, lectures, letters. Throughout his whole life, he had always given away books. He thought reading was a very important part of living, and everybody should have books, so he would give books to ministers and missions and jails, and anybody who needed a book that didn't have money to buy books, he gave books to. When he heard about Andrew Carnegie setting up libraries for people, and he said to them, do you allow African Americans in your libraries? And they said, no. Well, he didn't like that. He didn't think it was right that African Americans weren't allowed in libraries. So he said, what can I do to make this better so that everybody can go into libraries? He says, I know. I'll start libraries myself. So he did. He ended up contacting a gentleman named George, George Sherwood Dickerman, asking for assistance. He wanted to know if George would send him a list of 100 African-American colleges, or schools, I should say, that could use libraries. So they went back and forth, and um, they sent out letters to 50 schools, 35 of them answered, with their top recommendations of books. And I don't know, can anybody guess what the top book was that they wanted? The top one was The Life of Lincoln. The top 10 were The Life of Lincoln, Little Women, Pilgrim's Progress, The Life of Douglas, Ivanhoe, Paul Denbar, Ramona, Souls of Black Folks, Robinson Crusoe, and Uncle Tom's Cabin. He first thought that the library should get 50 books, and his idea was the libraries had to build a bookcase. They had to have somebody who would check books in and check books out, so there would be a running thing, so whatever, and um, a catalog. And he would send them 50 books, and they could keep them for a year, and then they could send them back and get 50 more books to get them started. He chose Atlanta University as the meeting place, as the place where the books would be distributed from, because it was on a railroad, and it was kind of centered of where most of the schools were. And they accepted, and they said they would do it. So at first he was going to do, he ended up doing 2,500 books for 50 schools and he packaged them up and sent them away. And he worked with Booker T. Washington on some of his books. One, one of the things he all, he said he really wanted to do is every single library should have the book from servitude to service because he thought service was a very important thing. And this is one of the books. The other thing is he wanted to make sure that, there, that um, every school got a subscription called Our Dumb Animals. And it's not because animals are dumb, it was because he wanted them to know how to properly take care of animals. So he made sure that everybody got fat. He wanted to make sure that all the schools got a cookbook so that the girls knew how to cook. 
and that's what he did. Just be, he, two weeks prior to his death, everybody, the books were ready to be shipped. He sent them all out. He wrote a letter saying everything's ready to go. The first 11 schools went out this way. And after he died, his wife continued to carry on that vision until she died in 1922. All in all, he donated between the schools, between missions, churches, and everything. He ended up donating over 35,000 books. Most of the things that he donated, he did anonymously. Uh, he would always, when he heard that a church was being built and they really lacked funds, he would send him a communion set and he would send him a bell for the church. He wanted to make sure that people could hear a bell ringing so they could be called to worship and he wanted to make sure that they were able to join in with communion to join in the fellowship of communion. So that's what he would send them. In 2017, I'm going to Tennessee to represent the Gregory family for the 100th anniversary of a bell that's on this one over here in Tennessee uh, that he donated. And that bell was in the old North Church of Marble Head. It was done at the Paul Revere Foundry. It was hanging in the church. And when they decided to get rid of the, the bell, he bought the bell and sent it to them. He also thought <coughs> education was a very important thing. He set up a church in Wilmington, North Carolina, and when he did it anonymously, he did it as Mr. Howard. But what he would do a lot of times is he would take the train where these places were going to be dedicated and just sit in the back so we could see what he had done. Well, somebody happened to be there who knew who he was, so they um, introduced him and he spoke and, and all. But when he was there, he noticed that they really needed a new school. So he ended up doing a school, a church, and a teacherage for the pastor and his family and all the teachers to live in. It was a three-story teacherage. Also during that time, during the Civil War in Wilmington, Sherman had sent a lot of the people down there. In the first winter, a third of the people died, so a lot of the kids were orphaned. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, and godparents could not take care of them. They just didn't have the money, so they decided they should build an orphanage. And they started collecting money. They collected $1,600 when JJH found out that they were going to build this orphanage. And he went to them and he said, I would like to build this orphanage. And so they allowed him to build the orphanage. They dug the ground for him. They built the orphanage and they offered him the $1,600. And he says, no, I want to build the old orphanage. Take that money and use it for another orphanage so other kids have a place to live. So they took that $1,600 from him and money from Mr. Washburn in Worcester, Mass, and built an orphanage in Atlanta with that extra money. After about six years, the grandparents and aunts and uncles and whomever could finally have the money to take the kids in, which they did, and they sold the orphanage, and they offered JJH the money, and he said, no, use that money to educate those children who are living in the orphanage because the parents are taking them in, they probably need that money. He also loved, as I said, children. Some of the things he did is he set up a twin fund. And a twin fund was when he found out that a mother was, was had twins, he figured she had an extra burden of having a second child. So he gave all of them a carriage for each of the kids. And then he would go to the bank, open up a bank, bank account for them, take them to the home and say, this is the start of your children's educational fund. And he did that. And after he died, he in his will, he left money that the interest would be used for twins to this day. And their people are still getting money from that fund, even though it's only $5 now. But, he, but a man that was at a, at a talk I was at told me that he was a twin. And when he was born, his parents went and got that five bucks because it was part of the legacy of their town and they <laughs> wanted to have it. And they kept the five bucks in a frame on the wall, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. On the 20th of February, in 1910, he died from pneumonia. Um, one of the things I forgot to tell you is that he also donated thousands of etchings to white Appalachian Mountain schools and to African American schools because he wanted kids that couldn't afford anything to have etchings or paintings on their walls in their bedrooms. He wanted them to have something on their in their classroom walls, and he also had them in the reading rooms of all their schools. So thousands of etchings he donated. And as I said, he did it all without notoriety. Like um, Andrew Carnegie would always get the press together whenever he was doing anything. 
we just found, I, I found out most of this stuff by going through minutes of the American Missionary Association. That's how I did it. My great-grandfather carried on the business until, until his death in 1952. J.J.H.'s um, third wife, his two wives and his children um, were buried in the mausoleum with him, and his third wife refused to be buried in the mausoleum with his other two wives. So she's there, buried in a flat near the mausoleum, but not in it. There was a big rosarian, if anybody knows a rosarian, she grew thousands and thousands of roses, and she was very well known throughout the country. After my great-grandfather's wife died, she asked my great-grandfather to take care of her roses because he was in that business, and he took care of his roses, of her roses, and then she wanted to marry him. And he said, no, I've only had one woman, and she's gone, there's nobody else for me, and she didn't like that, so he stopped taking care of the roses. <laughs> In his own town of Marblehead, some of the things he did were, let me get to it. Whenever his employees scooped out the seeds out of the vegetables, he would leave all of the vegetables in big boxes outside the seed house with a big sign saying, help yourself. That way, anybody could come and get vegetables. And he figured at least that way he knew the people were going to be able to make stews and soups and keep their families alive. He also set up bread stations throughout the whole town with loaves of bread so that people could pick up loaves of bread so they could have bread and then they have their vegetables or stews. Um, schools he donated money to, he donated paintings to. Um, whenever they had a fundraiser, he'd always go and he'd always provide ice cream for all the kids that were there. He did the same for the YMCA. He was one of the um, one of the founders of the Marblehead Historical Society. He loved Indian artifacts, and when he died, he donated 2,000 Indian artifacts to the Marblehead Historical Society. And they still have not all of them, but some of them on display, and they rotate them because they have a lot of stuff. There was a park called Bailey's Head that he loved. He loved he, one of the places he owned was right next to it. And he um, donated the park to the town with the stipulation that they would never charge for anybody to go into the park because he felt no matter who it was to be able to see the beauty of the ocean, whether you're rich or poor. So that was one of the stipulations. And in the will, if they wanted to do it, we can take the park back, the family. Um, local churches, he paid the past paid the salary of the pastor's church, the church he went to, the salary of the pastor, and after he died, he left enough money so that the interest could go towards the pastor every year, and to this day, he's still getting a small stipend from that, the pastor, because I wrote and asked. He donated pictures to all the churches when they opened in Marblehead so that they would have paintings on the walls. Uh, he donated books to the local library, and he left, in his will, he left a money again, that the interest would be to buy books for the library, and they're still buying books in his name. Um, the children of the town, he would stand outside when the kids were going to school, and he would give them candy and gum. And whenever there was a fundraiser, he would always pay for all the ice cream so all the kids could have as much ice cream as they wanted. He believed so much in education that if there was anybody in his town that wanted to go to college and couldn't afford it, provided a scholarship for every one of the kids in the town of Marblehead. He did the same for businesses. If somebody had an idea for a business and they didn't have enough money to start a business and he thought it was a good idea and he thought that they were, I shouldn't say anybody, if they wanted to open up a, a brothel, he didn't do it, but you know. If they, were, if they thought it was a good idea and they were honest and sincere about it, he always gave them the money to start the business. And his hope was that when they started a business, that they would pay it forward. So if they opened up a grocery store and somebody came in that couldn't afford something, he would be hoping that they would be able to provide that. Or if somebody came in, the bill was $12, and he only had $10, then he would let them have it for 12 or could arrange payments or something. Almshouses, I'm sure you know what an almshouse is, is that, that he provided seed at almshouses so that the people could grow vegetables and have that kind of food at the almshouse. Um, he set up building funds. 
he set up stuff. He, John, he would have flower shows, and the profits could go to the GAR. Library funds, the twin fund. When Ulysses S. Grant died, he spoke at, um, at Marblehead. They had a memorial service, and he was one of the speakers. People in the town where he lived, if they didn't have enough money to buy wood, the homes were warm during the winter, the Marblehead Female Humane Society would provide him with a list of people every year of who needed wood, and he would pay to have the wood cut.